I think you can wait till tomorrow. Really? Yeah, I just hope that they don't. Welcome, everybody. Can y'all hear me and see my screen? Perfect. All right. Well, I am Change my name, and I am the head of the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you all for joining Core Insights tonight. I'm super excited about it. We're going to be comparing open approaches and MIS approaches to inguinal hernia repair. And Dr. Flavio Malsher from NYU is- uh, You're muted now. I don't know what happened. Oh, there we go. Can y'all hear me? Perfect. Did y'all hear any of that? <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to go through just groin surgery, and I want to kind of to touch on just some of the history and like how we got to where we are, and uh, Dr. Mickey Reinhorn um, does an open preperitoneal approach, so we're going to just touch on different approaches of groin surgery. So thank you all for coming, and thank you to Dr. Malsher and Dr. Reinhorn for helping me with this presentation. I really appreciate it. So let me just put this one. All right. So again, we're gonna go over just a brief history of the groin, of groin surgery, and then we're gonna compare mesh approaches uh, to, in inguinal hernia repair, especially mesh in the preperitoneal space versus the onlay space, as in, in the Lichtenstein, which is the gold standard. Um, for the open preperitoneal portion, we'll talk to Dr. Reinhorn about his um, experience with that. And then for the laparoscopic robotic part, we'll be asking Dr. Mulsher some questions. So here we go. So according to the hernia surge guidelines of 2018, they have this table of all of the types of techniques. Last month, um, Megan from Toronto, she discussed the shoulder ice and some of the tissue repair. So we're not going to touch on those. This week, we're going to talk about these open mesh techniques and the lap endoscopic techniques. In terms of the open mesh techniques, there are a ton of you know, Lichtenstein's the gold standard. And then there's a ton of open preperitoneal approaches. And I, I was not trained on those in my residency. I'm not, I wasn't as familiar with these. So I wanted to take a second just to kind of touch on what those are and like, you know, talk about where we got today from those. So a quick history, uh, the preperitoneal space was first described by Dr. Bogros. I'm trying to get my screen, just, there we go was first described by Dr. Bogros in 1823. He divided the inguinal canal to fix external iliac artery aneurysms. So he was the first person to figure out that space. And so we call that the space of Bogros, which is the prepared neural space. And at that time, the, um, they did not want to get into the belly, into the peritoneum, because they would risk peritonitis and there was no antibiotics back then. So they did everything they could to avoid a laparotomy. So, you know, they, that's how he, you know, found his way to this preperitoneal space. And then interesting, Cooper and Morton, both in the 1800s, they were the first ones to describe the transversalis fascia. And they both separately noted that it was bilaminar, that there's two layers, and that the deep inferior epigastric passes through these two layers of transversalis fascia. Uh, later, Dr. Retzius um, discovered the preperitoneal space in front of the bladder at the midline, and he was unaware of Bogros's work. And then Rovier in early 1900s, realized that those two spaces communicated. So Dr. David Laurier out in California, he has this awesome YouTube video. Y'all should check it out down here. Uh, he goes through the embryologic uh, structures and fascial layers and it's really great. So he here is being shown dividing the peritoneum right in front of the inferior epigastric artery. And right away, you can see the second layer of fascia. So this is the transversalis fascia. But he points out, this is the posterior layer of the transversalis fascia, and that the anterior layer of the transversalis fascia is along the abdominal wall. Um, so that was like, I've, already, I've always seen this layer, and I didn't realize that that was a posterior layer. Other people also call this the intermediate fascia. Um, and here, you can see how he's taken down the posterior layer of transversalis fascia in this medial compartment but kept it up in the lateral compartment. And he calls the medial compartment the parietal compartment, and he keeps it 
um, down on the bladder because the nerves and blood supply to the bladder is under the transversalis fascia. So you have to pull it down to protect uh, the structures going to the bladder. However, laterally, those structures are protecting the nerve on the nerves on the pelvic sidewall. So he, you keep it up on the pelvic sidewall. So I, I feel like we've all, you know, taken down this layer, but I didn't, in my mind, until this preparing for this talk, realize that, you know, it's protecting the nerves on either side. Um, I kind of want to stop a second, just ask the experts on the call. With I'm, I'm still a little confused on two layers of transversalis fascia. Have y'all in your experience, I guess, um, I'm, I'm confused on where exactly that anterior layer of transversalis fascia is. You know, if we peel down this layer laterally, is there, you know, is there an obvious second layer or, you know, what's, what's your experience with, with this, with transversalis fascia? Because it, Cooper's descriptions say that both layers insert on Cooper's. However, here, you know, in this drawing, it clearly is not, um, you know, it doesn't stop at Cooper's. So I just wanted to stop and ask some of the experts um, if they've noticed two layers of transversalis and if there is an anterior layer, do we need to like, do we need to consider it? I mean, um, I, I can tell about laparoscopy. To be honest with you, until we see the robotics, Nobody really discussed this in laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs. We, we, we expose the preparatory space. Sometimes we, we find the transversalis and keep it up, keep it down. But it was only with the best visualization and, and the strategy of the, of the robots that we were able to see different layers. It's not all patients, but there's some patients that you can actually when you do the medial dissection that you put transversalis fascia down or the intermediate fascia down, you, you still can see something cover the muscle. And some patients not, for example, this one that I have the picture, we can see raw muscle up there. So probably everything is down. I mean, I think it's a bold statement to, to, to say that you are 100% of the time, you will keep this fascia, those fascia separated. It just, in a general concept, medially, we try to keep it down and laterally up. It's not the end of the world to do differently, but I think there's a safety issue that we can try to get the extra cushion for safety on those dissections. But I don't know, maybe Mike has an idea, but I, I the very few open preparatory repairs that I've done, I mean, I could actually see those fascias. I don't know if they have any specific trick. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I mean, that's interesting. I think I kind of agree with Flavio. I think everybody's kind of thickness, maturation, that fascia is going to be different. I think the general point that there's a peritoneum and then there is the transversalis fascia is probably the most important point. And I also agree with Flavio. Probably doesn't matter what plane you're in. It just more matters that you know what plane you're in and you're conscious of it. As far as an anterior and posterior layer of it, um, I mean, I don't know. I don't have a lot of robotic experience, so I, I, I can't say that I like fully appreciate that. I have a lot of kind of open and laparoscopic experience back there. And um, if I've recognized it in full disclosure, I probably just thought it was a little bit of flim flam that I just took. So. I, and I don't know if, I mean, I haven't watched this whole video, but I, does he exploit intentionally either the anterior or the posterior leaflet, or is it just more that kind of be aware where you are and know why sometimes they can feel like there's a layer that doesn't seem like it should be there? This is the most that he exploits it right here. So he just says, know this layer and know where your nerves are in relation to this layer. And about as far as he goes. Yeah, I mean, my, my bet is it's kind of one of those things like probably doesn't make a clinical difference, but it's important when you do inguinal hernia surgery to do anatomic dissections. And I mean, honestly, this one, my one comment, when I watch people operate, they're often jumping freely in between these two planes and not recognizing that. And that that's probably the most important point. Okay, thanks. So my, I'll, I'll add that, uh, you know, I wasn't aware that there was two layers until Ben and I did 
discuss shoal dice and did shoal dice dissection and on the floor of the canal when you open it if you open the floor you can almost in everyone see two layers and the the superficial most my understanding is the aponeurosis of the transverse is abdominis and the deeper layer is the transversalis fascia and they are two separate and distinct layers in most patients um, and when we do our preperineal dissection, after I learned that concept from Ben, I realized that if you only go through the superficial layer and do most of your retroperineal dissection between the two layers, it's much more vascular. There's no smooth planes, and you really need to get through that deeper layer to get on top of the, the peritoneum. And so, Mike, I do think clinically, I don't know whether robotics takes that away, but when you do an open preperitoneal, if you're in a retroperitoneum and if you're between the two layers, it is super challenging medially. Laterally, it's not a problem, but medially, you want to be deep. You want to be right. Sorry, medially, you want to you get it down so that you're on top of Cooper's. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks. And I'll show a video of Dr. Reinhorn's dissections in a little bit. Uh, here's just another picture, and this picture points out, again, the anterior and posterior lamella of transversalis fascia, so um, just something to consider. Okay, so quickly, just kind of going through the history again. Um, I'll go fast through this. So Annandale, he was the first one to use space abogus for hernia repair, and then Bassini and Halstead followed suit. Lister came out with antiseptics techniques after that, and so people started exploring the peritoneum more. And this GYN, Dr. Kelly, um, and a, Dr. Kelly, the GYN at Hopkins, he, um, he was the first one to incidentally repair a femoral hernia when he was um, doing a GYN procedure and he put a glass marble in the femoral space. Um, several surgeons then did intraperitoneal approaches to groin, groin hernias after that. And then after that, Cheadle in 1921 was the first one to use the posterior preperitoneal uh, plane to fix hernias. And then Nihas and Stapa followed suit after that. McEvity was the first one to do an anterior approach through the inguinal space to get to the preperitoneal space. And then Reeves and Once followed suit after that. So I was just gonna quickly kind of touch on, these are like the main pioneers of preperitoneal groin hernia. Um, and this is kind of just like simple. These are the techniques that you go posterior without opening the inguinal canal. And the ones below are the techniques in which you go through the inguinal canal to get to the preperitoneal space. So in my mind, it was nice to kind of just organize that for myself. So quickly to talk about the posterior approach to pre the preperitoneal space in terms of an open preperitoneal repair. Um, Nias, Nias was the first one to describe this in 1959. So he made an incision just above the internal ring. Um, lateral and above the deep internal ring and yeah went through the layers of the abdominal wall and dissected the preperitoneal space. Initially he did not use mesh and then later he used mesh to suture the um, the conjoint tendon or the internal oblique epineurosis down to Cooper's. Um, and then Stopa was the first one to do a lower midline incision and just coat them in mesh bilaterally. So he was the bilateral giant prosthetic reinforcement of the visceral sac. Um, and then Ugari, after that, was a Dutch surgeon that did a four centimeter incision um, lateral and cranially to the internal ring and again got into the pre peritoneal state space up high and put a piece of mesh over the myoperitoneal orifice. And then Kugel followed suit after that and his, um, he, he also had a, he had a classic groin incision that was, you know, halfway between ASIS and pubic tubercle you know, two thirds medial, one third lateral, and except he divided the transversalis vertically. That was his um, uh, approach. And he put a patch in the prepared nail space. This is the Kugel patch. It has a ring and two other layers. So it's kind of thick and bulky. He's known for that. And then the last one was the transrectus prepared to nail approach where you went medial and you found that rectus muscle and you went just medial to that. Um, to get to the prepared meal space through a Hasselbach's triangle. So Dr. Ricky Mine, Ricky, Mickey Reinhorn, sorry, um, I appreciate your video. We're going to show, he does a posterior approach to an open preperitoneal uh, hernia repair. So he's not going through the inguinal canal. 
He's going above the um, internal ring. So he marks out the ASIS and the pubic tubercle and makes an incision um, right about midline, two thirds medial, one third lateral, about four centimeter incision. And then he dissects down, divides the external oblique aponeurosis, then divides the, um, or separates the internal oblique muscles. And then at that point, you know, we're going through, uh, you know, transversus abdominis aponeurosis, transversalis fascia, and entering the preperitoneal space. So here you can see he's identifying the inferior epigastric vessels. And he, um, you know, right after he separates the internal oblique muscles, and he is then going to bluntly get into the preperitoneal space um, after identifying where your epigastric vessels are. Once he's in that prepared nail space, he identifies the hernia sac and starts you know, bluntly dissecting the hernia sac away from the surrounding fascia. And he then dissects the cord structures off of the hernia sac, as we typically do. And he completely frees the hernia sac, you know, down to the, the visceral sac of the peritoneum. And then here is a good shot of, he locates those inferior epigastric vessels shown there above the peritoneum and gets under them to enter the space of retius medially. Oops, sorry. And then he clears off the space of retius medially. You have a good shot of Cooper's, the femoral space is right there. And he's, you know, bluntly developing that space to make room for his mesh. And here is a shot. He has his um, retractor in the internal ring. And in a second, he'll show the uh, external ring. That is the cord going down into the internal ring on the medial side of the incision or the inferior epigastric vessels, which later he will um, uh, retract. He's kind of just showing how the cord structures are going down into the scrotum. And he lifts up his retractor so you can see where the external ring is in relation to where his incision is. And then he um, retracts the inferior epigastric vessels to show the space of Retzius, Cooper's femoral space. So it's a nice shot of his completed dissection. And then he inserts a large piece of mesh in the preperitoneal space, making sure to you know, completely cover um, the entire myopectinal orifice. He's tucking the hernia sac in front of that mesh to make sure it doesn't slip back under it. And then there's the shot of how that mesh is, you know, kind of folded nicely in the groin to fit the entire space. He shows medial. Then after the mesh is secured, he um, is in place. He secures the transversalis fascia to the mesh, but I think he recently changed and now you secure it to Cooper's ligament instead of transversalis fascia. And then once he does that, then he kind of, then he um, allows the internal oblique muscles just to fall back down. And then he sutures the external oblique aponeurosis after that. So Dr. Reinhorn, I, oh shoot, I don't have it in here. Um, I just wanted to ask you, so if you have someone who comes in with like an incarcerated hernia, it's, you know, he's not, not a sick person, but it, it's someone who has incarcerated bowel, are you gonna approach this the same way? Um, or are you gonna do in, you know, anterior groin? Like what are your contraindications to doing this? Is there a BMI cutoff? when would you not do this repair? I guess is my, my question. So, um, so first point um, is we do secure to Cooper's and that's one thing I learned from robotics when I trained on robotics, because I'm an ex-laparoscopic inguinal hernia guy. I did 500 laps before I did this and I did all tap. When I did robotics, we learned to suture to Cooper's ligament. And as you see, there's a clear shot you can suture directly into Cooper's and into the mesh under direct visualization so you know where you're placing your suture. Um, in terms of contraindications, um, we've, I, I've, as I've gotten older, the contraindications have become bigger. But the reality is 
um, you know, I used to do patients up to a BMI of 40 this way, and it would be a two and a half hour slog. Um, I think anyone over a BMI of 32 benefits from a lap because physically it's hard to retract the, the abdominal wall. Um, you know, it, more philosophical, but if the patients need to stay on an anticoagulation or need to be bridged, I don't see a huge value in, in digging around a retroperitoneum. So I won't do it if, if they're on a Lovenox bridge for some reason. Um, for an incarcerated hernia, this was my procedure of choice because I would go in, I would divide the inguinal ligament in half, uh, reduce the hernia, and then um, you can explore the peritoneum pretty easily from there. Um, and then if, obviously if you have dead bowel, then you, I just did a primary tissue repair, but uh, which you just make a bigger incision. But if there wasn't, you can put one of these pieces of mesh in and they go home the next day. Since you were, you used to be a laparoscopic tap uh, surgeon, what made you switch to this? What were the, yeah, what were the points that made you switch to this from a tap? You know, I, I attended a lecture one of Dr. Kugel's disciples 20 years ago and said, this is pretty interesting. It made more sense than a plug and patch to me. And so I learned it and uh, patients just recovered faster because you weren't putting them under general anesthesia and you're using tons of local at the site and, you know, I'm kicking myself cause we didn't do any studies 20 years ago and didn't have data, but it was night and day. My lap patients weren't healing as faster as my open patients. So I slowly converted from doing lap to open. It was just a faster recovery, at least in our patients. And I know my, my, my partner, Dr. Fullington is on this call and she, did five years of lap before learning this approach and got through the learning curve. And she much prefers this for her patients than lap. Yeah. And we still offer lap in the practice. I agree. Um, I like, I'm very new to all of this in the past year, but the other thing, aside from them just recovering faster, I think also it really is less invasive. I mean, most of the time we do not get into the abdominal cavity at all. Um, and I think there are a lot of pluses to that and not making incisions higher up on the belly where incisional hernias could potentially form um, are all pluses here. So I think definitely I still love my lap cases, but I, I choose, I tend to choose bigger patients for that and, and do this whenever I possibly can. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining tonight too. Yeah, so if I, if I may make a comment, I completely understand, and I think there's a great operation for those that are adapt and trained for it. But to hear this is less invasive than a laparoscope tap, I think it's kind of a stretch. I understand that for a tap, maybe that you go to the abdominal cavity, you do the intra-abdominal access, incision peritoneal closure, I get that. But a laparoscope tap, is less invasive than this. Just look the size of your incision, the musculature, the spread, those, you use a ton of an, local anesthetic. That's why you have good results. And I truly believe it. But there's a lot of retraction and that might be painful. And I don't think that is me, uh, it's less traumatic than laparoscope tap. That's just my point. I like it. Good point. Um, so here, uh, so quickly just to touch on like the anterior approaches, and then I'm going to go into some of the data that supports this approach. Um, these are the anterior approaches. Uh, McEvity was the first one to describe a, an approach to femoral hernias in which he did a vertical incision over the femoral canal, and he entered the prepared neal space through a vertical incision. Later, Reeves uh, entered the space through the inguinal canal and made a large incision from, you know, the midline out to laterally through the internal ring. Um, and you can see the deep inferior epigastric there. And so this was an extensive dissection. It, it was technically very challenging for people. Um, once he kind of put together all of the stopa repair and he did a unilateral stopa using a reeves mechie approach. So he did a large you know, prosthetic reinforcement on one side um, using the anterior approach. Uh, plug and patches and proline hernia systems are just good to keep in mind that these approaches are 
um, using the anterior space of the inguinal canal and the posterior preperitoneal space. So if, you, if you're reoperating on someone, you know, knowing that the mesh is in both spaces is good to know. Um, and also the hernia guidelines, they, um, in general, they do not recommend the use of either of these approaches because of the excessive use of foreign body and the need to enter both anterior and posterior planes. So the 2018 hernia surge guidelines um, do not recommend using these approaches. And then finally, the, the tip procedure is going through the hernia sac to enter the preperitoneal space. Um, let me go. Um, oh yeah, and then there's one more, the on-step procedure. So this was um, uh, lateral, or sorry, a transverse incision about three to four centimeters um, in length and also just going medially and placing uh, mesh halfway in the preperitoneal space and then laterally you put it where you put it for the lift and sign space in between the external oblique aponeurosis and the internal oblique. So this is the on-step procedure. So the data for open preperitoneal approaches, there's been a Cochrane review, there's three randomized control trials. Um, they could not do a meta-analysis because of the heterogeneity. So two randomized control trials with Kugel and TIP showed less chronic pain and less acute pain compared to Liechtenstein. And then there was one randomized control trial in which there, there was a Reeves approach and that showed more chronic pain, which knowing now how much dissection that took, that makes sense to me. No difference in recurrences. This was a meta-analysis of 12 randomized control trials of open prepared neural approaches versus Liechtenstein. They called them all TIPS, but they included the NIHAS, Kugel, Reeves, once TIP approaches. And with all these approaches, they again found less chronic pain compared to Liechtenstein. Um, and these were the three main studies that showed that there were, was less chronic pain and it was mostly the TIP and the Kugel procedure that um, pushed it that way. So hernia surge guidelines on this approach is that open preperitoneal is as effective as Liechtenstein, um, and it could result in less post-op pain, faster recovery. Just know that most of the data is based on TIP approaches and Kugel approaches and not the other ones. So um, if you're trained to do it, um, you, there's, there's a potential for less chronic pain, but there's just still not a, a ton of data out there. Um, we kind of already talked about this, so I was gonna skip this, but I want to ask Dr. Reinhorn and Dr. Fullington. So with this data, let's say some, you know, if there's a general surgeon out there who doesn't know how to do laparoscopic surgery or isn't, you know, comfortable doing lap or robotic surgery, do you think the typical general surgeon without those laparoscopic skills should learn open prepare to kneel to reduce chronic pain instead of doing a Liechtenstein or? Like, what do you think the learning curve is for this approach? I guess, Nora, you're letting me speak up first. <laughs> I wasn't um, sure who was going first on this. You know, I think there, there are different learning curves. There, there's a learning curve to get um, comfortable with the procedure. There's a learning curve to be an expert with the procedure. And then there's a learning curve to be a, an expert teacher inner three curves. I think um, within 25 cases, you can get someone comfortable with the anatomy and doing the procedures well. Um, to be really expert with it, with guidance, you need a couple hundred. Um, so it, it's not a easy operation to learn. It's a lot easier to teach someone who's done laparoscopy and understands the anatomy I think the video that you should you alluded to in the beginning, the YouTube video um, from David Laurier, I think is a phenomenal video. I watched at least the first 20 minutes and it's a great explanation. Um, you got to know this anatomy. You got to know all these layers to learn these operations. So, Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, I think what's so important with this is having somebody expert who can guide you through those cases, especially the first 25, but also be there um, after that when inevitably you get into a few that are harder than anticipated. Um, but we did get there within you know, a relatively short period of time. And I think it's absolutely possible and a great tool to have um, if, you know, if you can get that guidance. So I, yeah, I mean, I think ideally everybody would know how to do this. 
Thank you. Moving on, let's focus the rest of this talk on laparoscopic and robotic approaches. And then we kind of compare and contrast the two. Um, so the, the main two are the totally extraperitoneal TEP and transabdominal preperitoneal TAP. Um, so the first laparoscopic uh, repair of groin hernias began in 1982 and they went intraperitoneal in the eighties and put clips on the peritoneum. And then that developed, you know, just after learning all of the prior open preperitoneal approaches, then we applied that to laparoscopic surgeries. So TEP and TAP both came out in the early 90s. Um, TEP, you know, you're using a balloon to dissect in the preperitoneal space and never entering the abdomen versus a TAP, um, you're entering the abdomen and then pulling the peritoneum down. So Dr. Malsher is an expert at both of these repairs and has kindly shown us his approach to both of them. So this is his laparoscopic TEP approach. So here you can see the balloon in place, um, bluntly dissecting the space of retius. You can see the inferior epigastrics going up with the rectus abdominis muscles on the abdominal wall. Next, he put, places two more ports in, um, just slightly off midline, uh, contralateral to the, where the defect is. There's the first and the second ports. And then I thought this part was interesting, Dr. Mulcher. I've done several TEPs before, but I had not seen anybody take down the arcuate ligament more. And that is huge. I feel like that's a game changer in a TEP approach to give you just huge visualization and allow you to put a big piece of mesh in. So here he, the first step that he's doing is taking down that, uh, the arcuate ligament, or sorry, the, the arcuate line to give uh, more space. You have to be careful, obviously, not to enter the peritoneum at this point of the dissection. Um, but in a little bit, you'll see the wide space that he's able to create after he takes this down. Again, being careful not to enter the peritoneum. Um, so here he's about to start, but realizes there's still a little bit more arcuate in his way. So he's gonna take just a, um, a little bit more arcuate line down. There's the peritoneum, being careful not to enter it. So here, he has a large um, view of the space of Bogros here. So he starts laterally, uh, you know, blunt sweeps up and down, down to psoas. And you can see the genital femoral nerve down there on psoas. And next he goes into the space of Retzius and clears um, a few centimeters off of the pubic tubercle down. He goes on the contralateral side to create room for his mesh. He clears off Cooper's medially. And next he um, dissects the cord away from the hernia sacs. He starts with a, um, a lateral approach and he pulls the hernia sac medially so he can identify the cord structures that are attached to it laterally. And so he is you know, bluntly uh, creating the space between the hernia sac and the cord structures until he finds the vas deferens and the gonadal vessels. And there you can start to see the edge of the sac and the vas deferens going away. And he just kind of continues to roll up that hernia sac uh, lateral to medial until he's all the way around it. And I liked his uh, approach. There is a small hole right there. Uh, later on, you can see how easily he handles it and he just divides the sack right there and endo loops the entire sack. So he makes it easy, doesn't make it complicated. Um, your options are either to just divide the sack, put an endo loop around it, or um, if you don't have holes, just completely dissect the hernia sack if it's coming down easily. So I liked it, uh, made it simple. He just puts an endo loop around that sack and then he's done. Um, and then he is just making sure there's enough space for um, the uh, mesh. So he's you know, varietalizing the cord. And then there's room for him to put an extra large 3D barred mesh in that prepared meal space. And then he, you know, just make sure the peritoneum doesn't slip under the mesh. So 
he desufflates and then re-insufflates one more time just to make sure nothing has slipped. And then that's it. So no, no fixation, no attacking of the peritoneum. So before we get into the robotic approach, Dr. Malsher, do you always take down the arcuate ligament on these or was that just this video? Um, I really liked that maneuver. Yeah, so this is full credit to Jorge Dice from Colombia, Barranquilla, Colombia. This really was a game changer several years ago when I watched his, what they call e tap And it's not a must. And looking in hindsight, I can see my struggles a few years ago with tap what the tiny small spaces. And that's half inch opening or one inch opening it really gives you a big exposure so nowadays, I don't have a commitment. I start my case, but if I think that is the, my space is limited, I just transect the arcuate line for a one or, or, or half inch. You say properly, just make sure that it's not cutting the peritoneum, but sometimes you just cut it and just put a stitch or an over there. Um, I really like TAP. I think I'm the one of the laziest surgeons that I know. So I like to make my life very simple as much as I can. So um, I don't try to dissect, reduce big sacs into the scrotum and just transect them, put in the loop proximally. And that is, this is a literally 35 minutes operation. And um, nowadays with robotics, I have full access here, but I still book a couple of days per month taps because I think for my, my practice for unilateral primary hernias, nothing can beat that. Uh, I don't have the training that uh, Mickey has and all this exoperiton approach by open surgery. I think just, I like to visualize as I can. So this is, it is what it is. I think that is a very straightforward procedure. Awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. You make it, it, you make it look very straightforward too. And I like how much of an overlap you had. In the past, when I've um, done this approach, I just feel like sometimes that space is so small and I can't see as much and I can't put as big of a mesh in there, you know, but uh, this is great. So yeah, your, your, your mesh is never big, your space is small. So um, you need, if you're struggling with the mesh, you need to crisp it a, a bigger space. I like it. So here is his robotic transabdominal preperitoneal approach. Um, so again, taking first, you know, getting into the abdomen, taking down the peritoneum, uh, medially and laterally. Here you can see uh, where the posterior lamella internal oblique is going up to the semilunar line. So he's taking that down, being careful not to uh, injure the peritoneum. And here I liked it. He pointed out in this video, this is a skinny patient and he made it a point in a second to stay under that fat. So right here, you're gonna see some fat coming down with the peritoneum and he makes it a point, if you follow that, you're gonna get in, you know, into that pelvic sidewall where you're risking nerve injury. So right here, he makes it a point to get that fat up against the pelvic sidewall um, to have a little cushion between you and your nerves. So I think that's a good learning point right there. I think it's easy just to follow that fat out into the pelvis and you know, strip those nerves. Um, so here he's taking it all the way down and then coming back medial, getting the epigastrics off of the peritoneum. He's already done his medial dissection. You can see the space of Retzius is cleared down to Cooper's. And then after that, it's a similar approach in terms of just pulling that hernia sac out and um, separating it from the cord structures. He again goes lateral and just uh, identifies the cord structures. Here you can see him identifying these structures and um, just uh, rotating the hernia sac again, lateral to medial until he's, the entire cord is off. So, and there's a small hole in the peritoneum right there. And I like at the end, I feel like you also didn't make it complicated, like closing that hole either. Um, at the end, he sutures it all robotically. It looks pretty quick. Once all this is taken down and then 
again, I also liked your technique. Your two options are once you're dissected free away from the cord, you can either transect the sac endo loop or just resect the sac completely. So we're not quite off the cord yet, but um, you can have it on the next one. So here, options are either transect or to reduce. And I noticed in this video, you're like, it started giving it to you in terms of reducing and then it did it. But um, yeah, eventually uh, you were able to just transect it. And then this was a pretty big defect. So I know normally you said in the video, you don't normally close this hole, but this was a pretty big defect. And so you're making sure when you do need to close the defect to take very superficial bites of the transversus abdominis muscle right here, not to catch any nerves overlying anteriorly. And then place your mesh, tack it to Cooper's. So again, a wide mesh. And then here you can see just kind of quickly purse string that um, the peritoneum closed, the hernia sac closed, and then closing the defect. So again, another great approach. Uh, when do you decide between the two, Dr. Mosher? So as I said, uh, if it is uh, unilateral, primary, non-recurrent, small, moderate hernia, I'll go a lap tap, TP. If it's something else, uh, bilateral, because we can do bilateral taps, no problem, but we need to change size and I just do it robotic. Anything that I anticipate any kind of difficulty, like a recurrent hernia, uh, prior preparatory manipulations, our larger hernia, I go robotic. So you just, the ones that are really easy, I go TPs, and the ones that anticipate some difficulty, I go robotic. The closure of the deep ignoring or the, the indirect hernia sac, uh, defect is very controversial. I just feel those four plus centimeters defects, I don't feel comfortable to just leave a bridge. So um, I clean out uh, the uterine tract to make sure that I don't have the genital branch of the genital femoral running there. Is an under control bite of the iliopub tract. And as you properly mentioned, I don't do a full transfascial suture on the conjoint tendon, just take the kind of the posterior area of the, or a chunk of the transverse to avoid the iliohypogastric nerves that will be above. So, but again, super controversial, and I think it should be decided case by case. Now we are going to suffer to watch Mike doing a laparoscope top. Oh my God. It's gonna be great. Get ready. Oh. So, <laughs> similar, we take down the peritoneum, just like you, Dr. Walsher. Pretty high, we're above the arcuate line here. This is probably me, so you're suffering watching me, actually. <laughs> I'll speed it up a little bit for you, for your viewing pleasures. Uh, so here, as we go laterally, uh, you start to see the dimple and that's where the semilunar line is. So you transition from a uh, retro uh, rectus plane to uh, the preperitoneal plane. So you're just taking the peritoneum out here laterally and you're creating that space. And then um, we dissect immediately down to Cooper's and then we move laterally and go to the um, posterior lamella, internal oblique, where we'll see the nerves at the semilunar line. We'll clear off the semilunar line, both medially and laterally. And then we will divide it. So here we're up high. And also in the past, when I've learned this approach, we've started a lot lower. So until this year, um, I hadn't seen this wide of a dissection either but this allows a huge pocket for our mesh, huge overlap. Now you can see we're dividing posterior lamella internal oblique medial to those nerves, protecting the nerves all the time. I'm gonna move along for the sake of time. Um, same thing, we you know, pull the peritoneum laterally, dissect the cord off of the hernia sac, and we have a huge overlap for our mesh. And we place our mesh, we tack it to Cooper's and we tack the peritoneum back up. So very similar. Here is the data for TAP versus TAP. In general, there's no difference. So, you know, the hernia guidelines say that, you know, rarely TAPs can have more visceral injuries, but like, look at the percentages of all these differences. So clinically, like there's no difference in terms of vascular injuries, port sites, all that stuff. Um, but it says that 
in general, yeah, they're the same in terms of recurrence, post-op complications, they have comparable outcomes, and it should just be based on the surgeon's skill set. Uh, there was a meta-analysis in 2005 comparing LAP versus Liechtenstein, and overall they found that LAPs have less chronic pain and Liechtensteins have less recurrences. However, that was all based on this uh, New England Journal of Medicine VA study back in 2004, and that showed that there were more recurrences um, in the LAP group. However, surgeons in this study only required 25 LAP repairs to qualify, 90% of these were TEPs, which is notoriously harder to learn than TAPs. And then an ad hoc analysis found that there was no difference in LAP versus Liechtenstein once these surgeons had 250 LAP repairs. So if you look at this meta-analysis, this the weight of this study had 56%. So when you took this single study out, there was no difference in recurrences. Um, this is another study from 2004 of a meta-analysis with um, TEPs versus Liechtenstein. And again, found no difference in recurrence or chronic pain when you excluded one of these studies in which one of the surgeons had a 33% recurrence rate with TEP. The same thing, they only needed 25 surgeries to qualify. Um, this is a 21, um, this is a study with 21 systematic reviews and meta-analysis that also showed that lab had uh, less risk of chronic pain, no difference in recurrences. So overall, these are the guidelines. If the surgeon has the experience, um, they recommend down here, this last one, that you should do a laparoscopic or robotic MIS approach to reduce chronic pain if the surgeon has the experience. Um, in terms of the robotic data, there's not a ton out there. In general, there's one RCT by uh, Dr. Rosen's group, Purdue, at all, and that found that there's no difference in terms of um, recurrences rates recurrences, uh, short-term recurrences, and um, surgical outcomes, but robotic had higher costs, longer OR, higher surgeon frustration. And then the two-year follow-up published this year showed no difference in recurrences or chronic pain. There's been some retrospective cohort studies um, showing no differences in complications, but longer OR time for robotic. Uh, there's a one NISQIP, NISQIP study out there showing longer OR, higher cost, but no differences in major outcomes, except there was more SSIs in that one in the robotic versus the open. And then there's been um, retrospective cohort studies um, showing longer OR time. There are several retrospective studies showing that robotic is a safe approach, it is effective, it is feasible, but in general, longer OR, more cost is what the data shows. Um, so here's a case for you, Dr. Walsher. Pretend like this guy does not have a transplanted kidney. Sorry, this is all I got for you. <laughs> but so this is a guy acutely incarcerated in guinal hernia, and this is a recurrent hernia. He's had a prior onlay mesh right here, at open Liechtenstein, and now he comes to you with this acutely incarcerated inguinal hernia. So what would be your approach to that, Dr. Mulcher? Um, I'll tell you, there's no, for me, there's no doubt that I'll go robotic, even with that kidney over there. I mean, I, I have a few cases with a prior transplant uh, kidney on the groin. It's always hard, but you need to create a space between the kidney and the wall. It's not easy. Usually the ureter is not a big problem. Um, we can call the transplant people to be in the OR with you just to help you to mobilize, mobilize properly. Uh, but the book answer with the kidney will be open surgery, but without the kidney uh, on, the, on the graft, on the, on the, on the pelvis, uh, for me, I have no doubt that, that in that case, Robot helps me a lot. A 38 of BMI, uh, recurrent inguinal hernia. I, you can do tap or tap or lap or swap. Yes, you can, but it just make my life easier to have this enhanced laparoscopy that we call robotic. It's just a better tool to do the same surgery. Do you think the learning curve is different for robotic versus laparoscopic approaches? I mean, uh, robotics is easier than laparoscopy at, at large. So that's why the huge adoption, it's just easier to do uh, robotics than la straight sticks laparoscopy. My, my concern uh, is the learning curve of the anatomy and the dissection itself. That's, uh, we see videos that we just, we want to cry when we watch them because the problem is not the use of the machine, but it's proper the space creation 
uh, the proper mesh choice, positioning, size, fixation or not. So those are what is, those steps are really the ones that matter. Robotics just enhance laparoscopy. It's just to make our life easier, period. Uh, costs more, there's no doubt. Takes a little bit longer, yes, it takes. We have extra steps. It just aids us with some um, benefits of ergonomics. But anyways, um, but I, to answer your question, I think it's easier. Ro uh, robot is easier. I, I, I think that in 20 or 30 years from now, we, we get, we're gonna have a full generation of surgeons that will not be able to do laparoscopy. They will just open and robotics as we see with prostatectomy and urology or uh, their time serectomies on GYN oncology. They don't know how to do laparoscopy anymore. They do it open or do it robotic. And I think we are going to see that in general surgery in a few decades from now, for sure. So do you think since the risk of chronic pain, uh, where's that one at? I'm trying to find it. Well, um, since laparoscopic techniques have been shown to have less chronic pain in robotic, do you feel like the typical general surgeon these days should be more inclined to at least learn the robotic approach if that's easier instead of the Liechtenstein? Should there be more of an initiative to learn laparoscopic robotic stuff instead of a Liechtenstein since chronic pain is now like 10% after a Liechtenstein? Yeah. That's what guidelines tell us. It's just showing us. And we have more and more now with everyone understanding how to make this surgery, this operation in a proper and safe way, you're going to see more and more of those papers. It's just less painful. Point, period. And I think we should try to safely educate surgeons to do so. We've been trying to do this for the last 20 years. Laparoscopy has been just so hard. Now robotic becomes, it became easier to do so. But again, we need really to teach the anatomy and the safe uh, surgical steps to accomplish that those kind of results. But yes, we're going to see more and more and surgeons should train on those. And that is what the guideline says. If you have expertise in you, on open and laparoscopic or robotics, you should elect MIS. I like it. How do you apply this to a female? A uh, female has been even uh, years, uh, more than a decade ago, we know that in females, due to the higher incidence of femoral hernias, uh, comparing to males, uh, MIS approach has been indicated for even long. It was like one of the traditional indications for laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopy repair of inguinal crural defects. Okay. And then last question for you. When do you not want to do an MIS approach? Like if someone's had a prior prostatectomy, is that an absolute no for you or... Um... Not at all. I mean, uh, the book answer is do it open. I published my own series of 15 or plus cases of this, and we, I could do safely. But to be honest with you, every time I do one of them, I question myself, am I doing something wrong? Because if I have a bladder injury or a major vascular injury, I'll not forgive myself. So yes, we can do it. But nowadays, my uh, traditional open uh, surgeries are patient with poor status to be submitted to general anesthesia so we can do in the local. I have a few months ago a patient with a mediastinal mass compressing the heart. It couldn't lay down. So we cannot do general anesthesia. It was kind of seated uh, local anesthesia. Or uh, patients with prior preperitoneal repairs that elect not to get any risks. A patient comes and say, I don't want risks. I don't want, to, I want you to do the safest procedure maybe it will be open. Or, at the end, and the third indication will be this gigantic inguinal scrotal that go into the knee and below. If it is to the tie, I still, to be honest, I still try robotics, but if it goes to the knee or to, to the shin, um, I think that those are open for me. Okay. Awesome. Dr. Rosen, do you have any other, like, contraindications to like, doing a laparoscopic approach like um, yeah in terms of well I mean first of all it was a great discussion I agree with pretty much what everybody said I, I, I think kind of to broadly answer your question I, I in general 
think that for inguinal hernias, you should just do the safest approach that you're best at. Like I actually think that's what all the data shows and that's what all the guidelines really kind of dance around to say. And, and I would just say, regardless of the technique or the, the tools that you use, I mean, if you want to be an inguinal hernia surgeon in 2022 and beyond, I think you should know an anterior approach with mesh, a posterior approach with mesh, and an anterior approach without mesh. And you should work on those and work to get better. And depending on your environment, you know, if you have robotic capabilities available, good for you. Like I, I, I think Kayla, you know, like for us, it is simply not an option. Like there is no robot space. Like we, I mean, they're doing Whipple's liver resections, lungs, you know, TARS. There's no time to do inguinal hernias in the robot. It just doesn't exist for us. So, um, you know, we did a study. We looked to see it. I, we just didn't find that much of an advantage. But, but I agree with Fabio. I think there will be a whole generation of residents that won't be able to do it laparoscopically. And I, I think the consequences of that will be borne out that, for instance, we wouldn't be able to hire you at some of our hospitals if you actually required a robot for a lapping or hernia. We just tell you, no, uh, you know, do it open. Uh, we have no space for you. So I think that that matters and that's extremely unique depending on where you practice and neither is right or wrong. Um, it just is what it is. So for me to answer your question, look, I go where no one's been before. So to me, if somebody's had anterior approach, I go posterior 100% of the time it, with very few exceptions. If somebody's been posterior, whether that's abdominal surgery, whether that's prostatectomy, whatever, an anterior approach is perfectly acceptable. And then I, you know, I, I went with Mickey and, and, and Nora and learned how to do a, a shoulder dice. And I'm on my learning curve of that, but I, that's my no mesh repair. And I, I really enjoy doing that operation now. So I, I like that. Those are mine. So I would look at each one and I just try not to make it too complicated. I was kind of like Flavio. When I was younger, I'd spent five hours doing a prostatectomy and my partner, Jeff Marks, who was a private practice general surgeon who came over after like 15 years would be like, Mike, like, what are you doing? You're getting like four RVUs for four hours and all the stress. Like, why are you not? So, so I, I do think like it, it is time to kind of undercomplicate our decision making, not overcomplicate it. And the kind of overwhelming fear of chronic pain is probably a little bit overstated. And, and quite frankly, we'll see long term the consequences of all these MIS approaches. It's not zero. We learned in laparoscopy that there were some experts that were great at it. And a lot of people hurt people laparoscopically. So, um, so you know, we'll see. Looks like Flavio's got a kick out. Thanks, Flavio. Um, that was awesome. But yeah, I, I, I don't think anybody knows the answer. Uh, but it's, I think it's really important to be good at all of them. Sounds good. My question is, so I'm about to start practice, right? Whenever we have those groin hernias that are incarcerated, you can't reduce it in the clinic. And even when I know under general anesthesia, a lot of them reduce. Um, what if under general anesthesia, they're not reducing? Um, should I still tackle that laparoscopically? What are my odds that I'm going to be able to get that thing down without causing, you know, cirrhosal injury and stuff like that? Well, again, I mean, you know, my, this is my advice to every young surgeon out there is, you know, this is an inguinal hernia. This is not cancer. This doesn't require an R0 resection. And you don't want to hurt somebody to try and achieve some potentially unachievable goal. So the answer is there's a million tricks to getting incarcerated hernias reduced laparoscopically and I'm sure robotically. But, but my answer is you kind of just got to check your ego at the door. Always decide, am I doing something to show that I can do it? Or am I doing it because it's what's best for the patient? And um, so for me, if I could reduce it, I'd probably just do a Lichtenstein. Um, that would be enough for me. If, if it didn't work or something, I could always go back and do a lap angle. On, but I, I would try and make that less complicated, not more complicated. I'm curious what Mickey would do. Mickey, what would you, what's your advice? So every incarcerated hernia other than femoral, every inguinal hernia is always incarcerated at the external ring. 
because that's a fixed rigid tissue. The external oblique just doesn't stretch. So the first move I ever make is to cut the external ring. And then your hernia is reducible. Then you can figure out what you want to do. You can do an anterior approach. You can do a posterior approach. Yeah. Uh, you can convert to lap, but you got to make an open incision and cut. I, I make an open incision and cut the external ring. That's my first move and make it an unincarcerated hernia. Then I got all the time in the world. That's good. What do you do, Dr. Reinhorn, if you have a recurrence after an open preperitoneal? Megan? So I, I answer that in the chat. So I, it, you know, it's easy to go anterior. So just like Mike, if you have a posterior recurrence, so after laps or open or prostatectomies, we do anterior approach. It's a nice, you know, uh, plane where no one's been before. So, um, you know, if they're thin, we'll do shoulder ice. If they're thick, we'll do uh, Lichtenstein. And there's no scar tissue because the initial approach was high enough that you're not in the way and it's pretty easy. You just have to identify the nerves. Kayla, can I make one comment about, you, you talked about, the, the, I was when I watched Flavio and that kind of whole ETEP conversation and the cutting the arcuate line and whatnot, um, I'll just point out just so like it's clear for everybody, that's actually the same thing we do on a tap um, when we are cutting the, basically kind of doing a tar basically at the bottom part where we take it down to the arcuate line, he's just starting at the arcuate line and working up. And the reason why that's actually really relevant and like worth taking a second is in, we're both achieving the same thing, which is to get to the lateral space. And if you are in the pre-transfer salus plane, you need to make that move to get out there. If you're actually in the prepared neoplane, which is hard to do, but I've seen it done robotically, certainly more than I've seen it done laparoscopically, you don't necessarily have to do that. And if you're doing a TEP for all the TEP surgeons out there, this is the whole thing about what you talked about in the beginning. If you blow up the balloon and you see a little sheen of white on the muscle, you know you put the balloon pre-transversalis and you probably don't need to make that move. You can get out there laterally. And if you uh, see the belly of the muscle, you know you're above the transversalis fascia and you must get through that plane. So it's the same move. He's just doing it from the bottom up and kind of is cramped to see it because his balloon trocar is there. We're doing it from the top down. And I don't know if Mickey does it maybe during his prepared meal as intentionally, but, but for lap or robotic, that's, that's the move to get lateral, however you want to do it. I like it. In the interest of time, we can wrap up. Um, thanks so much, everybody for joining Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Malsher. I know he had to leave, but thanks for y'all's videos and your input and Dr. Rosen, of course, and we will see you guys next month. Thanks again. So for like, yeah. Real quick, a couple quick announcements before everybody jumps off. So first of all, thank you, Kayla. Awesome presentation. Again, this has been a big hit. Had a lot of people, a lot of good comments and discussion. Next month, it will be August 8th. Uh, we'll be discussing a very controversial topic, which is dealing with uh, contaminated hernias and all the intricacies of that. Tomorrow is Amazon Prime Day. So please uh, go to Amazon Smile. Uh, you can request the ACHQC um, to make a small donation for no extra cost of your own. And uh, last little pitch, uh, at the upcoming AHS meeting, for those of you who will be there in person, we are gonna have a QC session on that Thursday morning. We'll have four of our embedded randomized control trials. Some really good one year robotic data that will be presented versus open and, and, and uh, different approaches. So don't miss that. And again, thanks to all the speakers. Great job. And uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks. Bye.